In 1998, Otpor, Serbia's nonviolent pro democracy movement, well, they were just a tiny group of broke college students. But they decided to play a prank. They took an oil barrel, taped a picture of the Serbian dictator Milosevic to it, and put it in the middle of Serbia's capital city's largest shopping district. Next to it, Odpor placed a baseball bat. Then they went to a local coffee shop, grabbed a coffee, and watched. Before long, dozens of shoppers lined the streets of Belgrade for a chance to take a swing at Milosevic. Milosevic was despised by many at the time, but Serbians were too afraid to criticize him for fear of imprisonment. 30 minutes in, the police arrived, but what were they to do? They really had no grounds to arrest the shoppers, and the police had no clue who the culprits were, because remember, Akpur is just relaxing in a nearby coffee shop, but the police didn't know that. So what did the police do? They arrested the barrel. <laughs> The image of the two policemen quite literally dragging the barrel to their police car went viral for months on end. In the words of one member of Otpor, Milosevic and his cronies became the laughing stock of the nation, and Otpor became a household name. Otpor called their version of nonviolent struggle against oppression, laftivism. In 2012, we saw a similar event in Serbia, where a protest brewed under Putin's Russia. I put protest in question marks because the Siberian pro-democracy protest featured no humans. Only teddy bears, Lego characters, and South Park figurines, to name a few. When authorities arrived, they didn't see any culprits because there were no humans there. So what were they to do? You guessed it. They arrested the toys. The toys were hauled off in official police cars to be detained for their illegal behavior. Better yet, the government imposed an official ban on all future toy protests, which then went viral almost immediately, reminding dictators that laughter and humor is a dangerous opposition force. We are convinced that the only ways to combat oppression are with serious means. We protest, we debate, we go to war, but because of what I call the political humor paradox, humor is an essential tool for combating oppression. Now, the political humor paradox is relatively simple. In general, dictators and oppressors can't do much to prevent political humor against them. There's simply no defense against it. If dictators try and fight back, they only appear more ridiculous thus causing more political humor to manifest within the oppressed. It's the goal of an oppressor to dehumanize their victims and give them no hope of change. After all, humor illustrates their victims' capabilities for free thought, and there's absolutely nothing a dictator fears more than free thought. Put simply, the very existence of laughter and jokes means that a dictator has failed to dehumanize and demoralize their victims. This is humor for a definite purpose, that is, to ridicule the oppressors and keep the oppressed hopeful. Additionally, it's a surprisingly reliable index of the morale of the oppressed. Where there is humor, there is hope. Where there is humor, resistance is likely. Moreover, the reactions to humor by the oppressors give a really interesting insight into their own perceived strength. When oppressors can afford to ignore this humor, they believe they're strong, but when oppressors react violently, they're not. And as multitudes of researchers before me have found, dictators are never really confident in their, in their success by the very nature of a dictatorship. We know that authoritarian rulers' repression creates fear, which then breeds uncertainty about how much support the ruler has. In response, the ruler is forced to repress further. And in a similar manner, the political humor paradox tells us that if a ruler aims to be more repressive, the shutting down of humor only breeds more humor. Moreover, as long as the oppressor knows that their victims ridicule them, they can never really be sure of their victory. Oppressors thrive on knowing that the oppressed are afraid of them, and humor dispels this very fear. Surprisingly. 
Perhaps the greatest example of the political humor paradox comes from 1930s Germany, where my Jewish ancestors were in concentration camps. They were trying to survive to the next day. Now, when I was younger, it seemed like every week I learned more and more about the atrocities of the Holocaust. Day after day, my ancestors never saw their families again. They watched their friends disappear, and they feared for their lives in ways we can only imagine. As a young Jew myself, I kept wondering how my ancestors made it through. But then... I found the story of Antonin Oberdeau. Now, Antonin remembers what it was like living under Nazi occupation. He recalls the anger that the Germans in Czechoslovakia washed away inscriptions making fun of their Fuhrer most vividly, only for these graffiti mocking Hitler to reappear again the next morning. To those under occupation, the Nazis' anger was hilarious. But moreover, humor served as a no-cost, anonymous way of fighting back. Now, two jokes in particular were extremely effective against the Nazi invaders of Czechoslovakia. The first involves a calendar and a pamphlet. Now, for a little bit of history, soon after the war broke out, German soldiers received and distributed a calendar of events that they believed would take place on future dates. According to the schedule, England was expected to be on her knees no later than August 15th, 1940. But then August 15th came, and August 15th passed, and England was far from on her knees. Soon after, the Czechs, who were being oppressed by the Nazis, distributed leaflets reading, Do you know why Hitler has not invaded England yet? because the German officers could not manage to learn in time all the English irregular verbs. Another pamphlet distributed at roughly the same time read, Do you know why the daylight savings time has been exceptionally prolonged this year? Well, because Hitler promised that before the summer is over, he and his army will be in England. The pamphlet made the Nazis furious. Waves of mass arrests actually followed the spread of this pamphlet. Apparently, the Nazis, even though they were the ones in power, didn't enjoy being the butt of the jokes. And better yet, even the Nazis, people in control of a government who was at the time going to war with the world, well, they couldn't fight back against it. Because when they imprisoned the people who made the pamphlets, more pamphlets were made. And these were much more anonymous. But after these pamphlets were spread, it was near impossible to find a Czech truly loyal to the Germans. According to one legend, there was one person loyal to the Germans who was found an old man who proclaimed on the street that Adolf Hitler is the greatest leader, the Germans are a noble nation, and that he would rather work for ten Germans than for one Czech. Well, the Germans went up and they asked him what he did for a living, and the Czech Nazi supporter reluctantly admit, admitted to being a grave digger. In fact, waves of humor often followed waves of restriction or orders from Germany herself. When foreign broadcasts were declared a form of high treason, treason the following story allegedly occurred. A Czech guest is leaving the restaurant one evening and says to his friend, Good night. Now I am going to listen to the London and Paris broadcasts. Now, he's overheard by a Nazi soldier and is followed to his home. But when the Nazi soldier investigates this man's home, no radio can be found. Do you listen to foreign broadcasts? asks the German, German man suspiciously. The Czech replies, oh yes, I just can't help it. Then he kneels, puts his ear to the ground, and says, that's London there. After that, he puts his ear to the wall of the neighboring apartment and whispers, ah, that's Paris there. So the Nazi soldier, he hurries around to the adjacent flats, and in the below flat, there's a high official of the German SS administration, and in the other one, there's the German officer in uniform. Moreover, in the example of the Jews during the Holocaust, jokes really mocked the torture that the Nazis inflicted on them. Now, take the example of survivor Lily Rickman. She, upon arriving at the camps, like every other Jew, was forced to shave her head. She laughed at her free haircut. 
The laughter was rebellious, if not a little crazy to everyone around her, but it definitely caught the guards off guard. Moreover, she made the Nazi guards think that they were doing her a favor, not dehumanizing her. Moreover, if the Nazi guards chose to joke about the prisoners themselves, the Jews would join in and laugh at the same jokes. The ability to destabilize an oppressive situation by laughing at the expense of oneself was extraordinarily common for the Jews during the Holocaust. And by laughing at these jokes, they subverted the very power the jokes may have had over them. While jokes were at one point used as a weapon to oppress, Jews made the same joke and laughed at themselves, thus getting rid of any power that the jokes may have had. Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel explores this concept in his novel Gates of the Forest, where Gregor, the main character, is orphaned like so many others during the Holocaust. Gregor is hiding in a cave when he meets Gabriel, who teaches Gregor how to employ laughter to catch his oppressors off guard. Gabriel's humor allowed him to rise above the anti-Semitism, because to laugh in the face of fear allows that fear to dissipate. Laughter becomes a concealed dagger against oppressors. One Holocaust survivor remembers how one day the Nazis' guards were hitting them black and blue, and they were laughing while we made fun of them. The guards ended up laughing as well, thus stopping the assault. Now, the Nazis may have gotten the last shot and the last punch, but the Jews got the last laugh. Now, the political humor paradox gives us insight into the power of humor as a resistance tool as well. We've seen how comedy has been used in the face of totalitarianism and in the face of oppression. But this much is clear. We must use comedy as a tool of resistance. It's not to be used all the time, but when we want to seriously combat oppression, paradoxically, we must joke about it. Now, this is counterintuitive. But history tells us that those who made fun of their oppressors had one of two things happen. Either first, the oppressor ignored it, thus elevating the spirits of the oppressed through laughter. Or second, the oppressor tries to stifle the laughter in some ridiculous way, which only spawns more jokes. And that's the beauty of the political humor paradox. It works. Sometimes we must laugh in the face of oppression. And by making the oppressor the butt of the joke, the oppressed gain power over the issues that challenge them. Now we see other examples manifesting themselves today. The most prominent example are the dozens of comedians, such as Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock, who are using humor to critique the systemic oppression painfully apparent in the United States. And the US government can do nothing to stop them from doing so. Any action that the government takes to prevent these comedians from joking will only be met with more humor from some of the funniest people alive right now in an age of social media where these jokes can be spread. <laughs> I shall leave you with the story of my sister, who was the subject of an anti-Semitic attack when she was called a rich Jew at elementary school. She proceeded to pull out her wallet pull out a $10 bill, give it to her bully, and she said, buy some better insults. Thank you.